It really is a pleasure to introduce Damon Owens. Uh, Damon Owens, I'm going to say, is a Philly guy. He says, no, he's a Jersey guy. But I'm adopting him now, even though he's through mushroom country there in Kenneth Square. He's an adopted suburbanite, let's put it that way. He earned his bachelor's degree at Boston, Univer Boston University, Brown, sorry, Brown University, oh boy, Brown University, and his master's at UC Berkeley. I don't get that. I don't oh my gosh, I don't get that. He's been an international speaker and evangelist for over 20 years and is widely published marriage expert who appears regularly on radio and TV programs. He's also an accomplished gospel singer. Now, if we're lucky, maybe he'll sing half his presentation. I'm not sure, but maybe he'll have a tune. But he performed a solo during the 1995 Papal Mass at Giant Stadium for Pope John Paul II. It's really impressive there. He and his wife, Melanie, have eight children and two grandchildren. It is really my honor and my privilege to introduce Damon Owens. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Bob. God bless you. Thank you, Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. This challenge, waiting for him to call a foul on me. I'm like, David Owens, offensive foul. <laughs> I would actually film that, and I would pay you to do that for my kids. <laughs> my son would get a lot of props for that. Good evening. And thank you also for, for coming out tonight. Can everybody hear okay? Is that all right? Can you hear? Good. Thank you for coming out. As you see, as you'll see in just a moment, uh, I know very well how hard it is to come out on any night, much less a weeknight, if you've got kids, much less any other thing, right? It's difficult. And yet one of the things I've been very, very impressed with, very uh, moved by, are with the invitation to come and speak with you is the passion, the passion that leadership here at St. Andrews has for you. The vision for the parish. And I, don't, I don't say this lightly because in addition to my, my speaking and traveling on marriage and family and oftentimes with my wife, Melanie, I also do some work for a group called Communio. And Communio works with parishes. We work with bishops, vicar generals to help enliven and revive parishes around relationship, we call it relationship culture. That's things like invitation, hospitality, uh, events that draw people in so that you want to come to deeper encounter with Christ. Not just starting out and offering, you know, more of the top of the top of the ladder things and saying, well, if you don't come, you're not Catholic. You know, we're going to do a procession. We're going to do an adoration. We're going to do, you know, a rosary together. I do all those things. I do them because I love them. And I do them because I'm part of a parish, St. Patrick's Parish in Kenneth Square. And we have small groups and we have men's groups that I'm actively involved in. I work in, in everywhere that I can in that, but I belong. And that's probably going to be the first word for tonight is to belong. And if we have that peace in our heart, we recognize that to belong is fundamentally human. We, we need to belong. And tonight's focusing on family with an eye on families in the parish, being a family of families, with an eye on belonging individually as part of small groups to discover things about yourself and other people, about things within your marriage for those of us, those of us who are married, and how we move from an I to a we to that work in the family of not only transmitting the stuff of the faith, but transmitting that, that irreplaceable belonging. I love that phrase. An irreplaceable belonging. Like you know, not only does, do I belong to Melanie in a beautiful way, She's convinced me in 31 years that I'm irreplaceable. And I don't care if she's lying. <laughs> I, I, because it's good enough for me. Because I believe her. She doesn't lie. But it's more than just a head knowing. It's a heart knowing. It's, it's your deepest inner self knowing that you not only belong to someone, that you belong somewhere, but that next level of belonging irreplaceably. There's a delight that happens in us that goes beyond happiness. It goes way beyond pleasure. It enters into that realm of joy. Joy. And I begin and end with, with joy, whether it's in marriage work or in talks like tonight, because this is one of the few areas where you can't fake joy. 
You could talk around love. You can, people say stupid stuff. Why'd you do it? Because I love you. Why'd you do it? For love. And part of me is like, yeah, I'm not sure that's love. We, we get the, the fake out once in a while around love. But you can't fake joy. Because joy is something that flows from us, in, in either authentically or not at all. So in that sense tonight, I want to share some of, of my own story. I want to share some of the, the deep water of why that matters to us. But for those of you who, who don't want you to get lost in the weeds, there's, there's a lot of back things that I want, to, I want to give you the depth. I call it the gravitas, the gravity, the weightedness of what I want to share. But don't let the details, don't let the, the, the things confuse you. Tonight is about an invitation to belong. Whether you're a parishioner now, you've been a parishioner for, forever, whether you're a parent in the school, whether you've done this or you've done that. Our parishes, our churches are places where we're cons- constantly invited to belong more deeply. To that point of, being, of belonging irreplaceably. All right? And that's not in terms of a task as a lector or as a RCIA or, or you know, a job. It's belonging for who you are. So let's, let's keep that spirit even as we move through some of these things. Um, that's just an easier way to connect. Our marriage work is called Joyful Ever After. We hosted the Catholic Marriage Summit, welcomed 39,000 couples over a weekend. It's still available to hear witness talk of about 60 couples. I mentioned Communio, working with parishes. We also have uh, Epic Intimacy. My, I say we, meaning my wife Melanie and I in our marriage work. So these things are available here. I'll show this at the end if you want to take that quick response code. But he died. This is my baby. Melanie and I have been married, as I said, in April will be 31 years. And in those, those very short years, the Lord has blessed us with eight children. As you can see, all boys except the first seven. <laughs> I have no idea why you're laughing. It's about mindset. It's about mindset. It's about seeing what you want to see. Uh, it's been all girls all the time. We married in 1993. I'm serious. I went, I went through the six pregnancies, and then God brought us a beautiful Olivia through adoption. I went like 15 years thinking all babies were girls. <laughs> like, where do the boys come from? You know? And I had plenty of, of advice from friends before my, my, my Nathan came to us in 2010. So Naomi is the oldest, Leah. Rachel, Therese, Colette, Veronica, Olivia, and Nathan. So Nathan and I are still blessed among women. <laughs> and my oldest, Naomi, married a wonderful young man from uh, Rose Valley, near outside of Philadelphia. He's uh, finished his six-year contract with the Marines, and now they're living nice and close to us. And the greatest gift of all is my grandbabies. <laughs> yeah, should have had them first. That's what I think. <laughs> It's like every, <laughs> should have had them first. It's much, much easier. I got to get a new picture because Robbie, Robbie's hair came out like this. He's got these big sauces and his dad shaved the side of his head like, like short like this. So I call him Robbie Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> and he answers to it. So <laughs> he's, he's all good. Marin and Robbie, are my grandbabies. Oh, this is going a little slow here. There we go. But I want to talk about the role of the family. And you'll see I'm going, to, I'm going to move back and forth here in the short time that we have. In fact, I need to start my, my hook timer. There we go. Between who you are as a person, as an I, it's called an I. For those who are married, that now I, thou, that marriage, that communion of eyes, right? And then the family that flows from that. And then how the families interact with other families. And how the parish in particular, as a family of families, has a very particular role in our formation. And what I want to begin with is the reality that everything that we experience here, God created for us, for you. God is so focused, he is so passionate about us becoming all that we are. That's not a an optimism phrase. I'm talking about holiness. 
I'm talking to become fully human. Not in some general sense, but to be a unique, unrepeatable image and likeness of God. Now, I realize some of these phrases and some of the things might be new or I'm putting them together in a new way. This is what's beautiful about the end and that invitation to come and to, and to process this on your own, to think through what these things actually mean. But God created us in his image and likeness uniquely and unrepeatably. And he repeats that at every moment of conception. Every new person, whether you're you know, influenced by the authority of science, sociology, theology, biology, whatever you're looking, you can find signs both in the physical and the spiritual that point to the unique and unrepeatability of every human person. That's amazing. There has never been and never will be another you. And the way I think to receive that is, is, is that wonder and fascination. That's awesome. The, the, the idea that God can create so uniquely and unrepeatably and still carry with us such in common that we can come together tonight and talk about who we are. That's a classic Catholic paradox. We're ultimately unique and unrepeatable, and yet we have so much in common that we can come together and talk about what does it mean to be. It's both and. And to speak about the role of the family is to begin with that truth, that we're created for purpose. We're created with meaning. We're created with mission. And the, the individual words we have now in English are all really inadequate. So I want to unpack that. But the I, as we read even in the very first chapter of the first book of our scriptures, the whole Christian story begins with the story of family. It doesn't begin with the creation of a church. It doesn't begin with law. It doesn't begin with morality. It doesn't begin with government. In the beginning, the earth was dark and void, and the Spirit of God hovered above the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was. And that first creation story sees God creating through separation in the first three days, the light from the dark, and it was good. The dome in the middle of the sky, waters above and below, and it was good. The waters to the basin to reveal the dry land, and it was good. It's God creating time, space, and a habitat, a place to live. Then in that poetry on days four, five, and six, God goes back and fills all that he created, which is why on day four, it goes back to the light and dark of day one and fills the sun and the moon and the stars. He fills what he created through separation. On day five, goes back to the waters above and below and fills it with the birds of the air and the beasts of the sea. Then the morning of day six, he takes that dry land and fills it with the creepy things and the beasts and the cattle. And then pauses and says, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over the earth and subdue it. Identity, relationship, mission. Then the second creation story, which is this, a different perspective, a different view of the same event. And if you read it, it's almost, it feels really disjointed, like when you go from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. But we're talking here about the beginning. And it's important to note that in the beginning here, it begins through relationship. And Genesis 2 is the view of creation from man's view to God, which is why it literally begins on the ground. The Lord God formed from the clay, the dust, the earth, the body, breathed his spirit into the body, and man became a living being. That's what the poet said. It's this body from the stuff of the earth, the stuff of the cosmos, with the very breath of God, his divinity, and somehow together they form something new. A human person from the divine persons with a body, and with a soul that together makes us a person. We're not spiritual beings. Those are angels. We're not just bodies. Those are animals. We're somehow both and and neither. 
My friend Christopher says we're like angels. And that identity of who we are gives us more light when we look at the second creation story, that Lord God formed from the clay, the dust, the earth, the body, breathed his spirit into the body, man became a living being. God picked him up, put him into a paradise, and said, it is not good that man is alone. And I will find a helper fit for him. This is worthy of a small group Bible study. Trust me. Because that word helper is not a sign that somehow there's work to be done and we need two strong, two strong people. We need four hands for this work instead of two. It reads in the English like, I need a helper. But in the Hebrew, the phrase that's used for helper, that's translated to helper, and you have to remember this, just to give, it's ezer kenegdo. It's a Hebrew phrase, ezer kenegdo. The Lord God says, I will find ezer kenegdo. And to the Jew, hearing that, they don't hear task assistant. They don't hear so much work we've got to do. They hear, oh my gosh, with an Azair Konegdo, this is the other that without, I cannot be. It carries with it a, 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 a gravitas, a weight that says, I can't even be. This is why God said it's not good for man to be alone. And we get a hint of it in the first story. But God pronounces it not good, brings Adam into a paradise where he has everything. And the Lord God walks him around and shows him around and says, you know, don't treat, eat from this tree, the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, this one here, and you can tell everything in the entire garden. The whole world is yours except that tree. And Adam said, okay. Then you would think God immediately brought the solution, right? Because this is a problem. It is not good that man is alone. The first time declared not good in either story. But he doesn't immediately present the solution. He has him to name the animals. <laughs> I've often called this a biblical commercial break. John Paul II corrected me on this, but it's like, here's a problem, it's not good, I'm gonna find your Azera Connecto. I need you to name the animals. And if we look at it like historically and sequentially, it seems out of order. But if we look at it, I'll say, relationally, particularly a father and a son, we see God the Father creating Adam, giving him this authority, dominion over the earth, this image and likeness of himself, and yet the son has not yet exercised the authority. This, this, this came crystal clear, not just with kids, but even with my son, Nathan. It's like, I'm trying to give him more responsibilities, you know, doing things here or there. And he gets really jazzed when I'm like, you know what, Nathan, from now on, you can, I can, Dad? I can, really? Yeah, man, you got it. I need you to do that. I got it. I got it. There's an excitement like getting a task, a role, a mission from Dad. Especially when you think, I couldn't do that before, but now I can but there's something wholly different when he actually does it for himself the first time. Hey, Dad, I brought the cans down, and, I, and I, I picked them back up after the trash guy came, and I made sure everything was back in. So thank you, bro. Appreciate that. That was like, that shine went off a long time ago, but <laughs> in the beginning, <laughs> that was a big deal. And I was like, dude, take the trash down. Okay. But that first time you exercise an authority, it then becomes yours. Adam naming the animals now exercises an authority, and a power, an office, a role, a sonship that was only conceptual before then. And as if looking for his Ezer Konegdo among naming all of these animals, he found none of them like him. Then God said, ah, now you're ready lays him down into a deep sleep, takes some of his own life, forms this new body. Adam wakes up. The Lord God brings the woman to the man, and Adam's like, ah, oh, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and I will call her woman, for out of man she came. It's a glorious song. It is a song. 
and the joy of not only seeing this other that for all intents and purposes looked just like him. He recognized himself in her. And yet, she was different enough that he kind of saw her for herself. So there's a recognition, there's an acknowledgement that this is not another animal. This is not one who I have this control over. This one is equal to me. And he was able to do that with a gaze, the ability to look into the eyes and see. Now that gaze between Adam and Eve spoke a language. It spoke a communion. That's the word I want to get to. This is a peculiarly Catholic word, communion. And it's a, a common union, a communio. This role of the family, this role in marriage, is not just an authority, it's not just a mission, it's not just a task, it's a gift. It's a role, it's a high honor, it's a vocation. Now these are all the different words we have in English. But in the Latin, there's one word that describes all of these. It carries with it in its own sense. Does anybody speak any other language besides English? Well, maybe from another country? You know how there's words you can just translate, right? And there's some words you need like a whole paragraph to translate. So I said, what does that mean? You say, well, if it's Sunday and this one's mad and if the sun's here and then it's, and somebody goes like this, then you say, you explain like a whole paragraph of some words that are in culture, the cultural words. There's a cultural word in our faith that helps us understand this munis. Munis. Say that with me. Munis. 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 Strange word. It's a gift, a role, a mission, a vocation given by someone in authority to you in order to accomplish something that you can't accomplish on your own. For example, the munis of the Blessed Virgin is to be the mother of God. The triple munera of a bishop is to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. The muness of the family, Pope John Paul II reminded us, taught us, one, to form a communion of persons. Can you guys hear okay? I'm hearing like an echo. Okay, good. Form a communion of persons. This is what we do. The communion is built into the mission of being a family. It gets back to not just belonging, but experiencing an irreplaceable belonging to someone. Second is to serve life. It's not a once and done. The family is there because, all right, let's speak biologically. It takes 24 plus years for the brain to fully develop in a human person. And those are not 24, two plus decades of just learning stuff. It's not like a, a data input. It's this constant formation, this constant becoming, this call to become that's the fruit of belonging. Life is love and love is life. And I hesitate to use that word because I'm going to unpack it here. But this is where life and love become a singular experience. The second munera of the family is to serve life. The third is to participate in the development of society. We're not meant to be alone. Isolation is not part of the human experience. It is not good the man to be alone. It's not part of the marriage experience, although we often feel lonely, and it's a deep wound. And it is not meant to be part of the family because the opposite is the munis, to belong irreplaceably, and then in that fully formed human person to enter into the culture to teach by your very presence, patience, forgiveness, willing the good of another, entrustment, all the virtues, perseverance, temperance, fortitude, justice, everything that we honor, both human and divine, we have to be taught. 
It's a paradox. We're made for it, and yet we have to learn it. We're made from love, God, with the capacity to love and the deepest desire to be loved. That's a human person, and yet we have to learn how to love. But we learn it not in lessons. We learn it through experience. We learn it through encounter. We learn it because, again, we're unique and unrepeatable. There's never been another you and never will be. And yet our humanity binds us together. Our need to belong irreplaceably. Our desire to love and to be loved. The depth of need for justice. Right? And name all the virtues. And finally, oh my gosh, my back. Oh, share in the life and the muniness of the church. So, four munera, if you will, four task, role, mission, gift, office, high identity given by someone in authority, God, to accomplish something that we can't accomplish on our own. We can't accomplish these things under our own power. We could try. We could desire it. We could really want it. We could work for it. But it's not about human effort. It's about allowing God to make these things visible in the unique truth of who we are. This is the muniness of the family. Let's talk about love. Pope Francis invited Christian families to value the gifts of marriage and the family and to persevere in love strengthened by the virtues of generosity, commitment, fidelity, and patience. He, God, seeks to encourage everyone to be a sign of mercy and closeness wherever family life remains imperfect or lacks peace and joy. In other words, it's a school of love. That the great mission, the muniness of the family, is not just to be understood, it's not just to be accepted, it's meant to be lived even imperfectly. Because as you know, as, as parents and as husbands and wives, we're both teachers, and more often than we realize, we're students. We're learning. Our kids teach us more than about anybody else except our spouse. And just when you think you understand yourself, you get one of those kids. And they just know right where to get in and things be like. Pink. Or they know just how to delight you. And they can just turn their head and you're like, oh, you're the best. <laughs> the little one could just turn their head and you'd be like, stop. Don't even know. The answer is no. Because there's something in us that's getting tested. It's our patience. It's our, the, di the difference between how we perceive ourselves, how the world perceives us, and how God sees us. We have a lot more grace with ourselves, usually, than we have with others. We have lots of reasons. Well, you know, I was really tired. I haven't eaten in five hours. I just had a bad moment. But as soon as somebody else does it to you, oh, you're always like that. <laughs> right? And in the family life, we have all of those experiences. All of those. The way we hurt each other, the way we breathe each other up, our affection, the withholding of affection, Forgiveness, lack of forgiveness, teaching our kids to be patient as we're trying to do it patiently, <laughs> teacher and student. And yet there is nothing that can replace the reality of family. There is no substitute. As Professor Robbie George has always said, he says, the Department of Health and Human Services, <laughs> so the family, is the first and perfect Department of Health and Human Services. When the family fails, we need all these other social structures in order to, to compensate so that you don't become a terror to the world. Because the fruit of the family is the contribution to the culture, to the civilization, and whether it will be. So how can we be this effective sign, to be this domestic church, of the phrase that comes out of our tradition, to look at our families as a domestic church? And again, that's worth meditating on. How can the family be a domestic church? 
most of us have been raised to think there's a two separate things. <laughs> there's the church and then there's the family. What could be the connection between the two? Well, very clearly our, our, our church teaches that it is not in the building or in worship that we first learn the name of Jesus. It's not in some extra family reality that we experience love, belonging, affection, fatherhood. And probably the most powerful experience of fatherhood determines how we receive God as a father. And not even just on or off, like, oh, that whole father thing, but just what is the father? Is he the taskmaster? Is he the one watching everything you do? Is he judging you? Is he waiting for you to do something wrong to tell you that you're going to... Where do we get this from? Is our value based on our ability to perform? When I do better, I'm loved better. I'm more lovable. When I do worse, I'm just not worthy to be loved. These things aren't thought through. These things are remembered. These things are recalled, and not in the, the prefrontal cortex of the, the executive part of the brain. They're remembered in the emotional brain, in the amygdala, where the shortcut happens between something in the past emotionally and something in the present. And when we experience something in the present that's close enough to something we had in the past, you immediately have an emotional reaction. Sometimes it's joy. Like, I don't know why I love this place. To this day, I love cigars. You know why I love cigars? I mean, I've had some good ones. But it started before Mr. Bokikio. He was my fourth grade football coach. Mr. Bokikio had the big, fat, dookie cigar, right? This was back in the 70s, so there were no family complaints, right? To this day, I associate the fall, cut grass, sweat, and even watching football with the smell of a cigar. And as soon as I smell one, I go, oh. Because that's where that man looked at me, had me on the shoulder, and was like, you go, Damon, you go. And I was like, yeah! <laughs> right? And when you're like nine years old, that's all you want to do. You'll be like, yeah! <laughs> they go, now go out there and get up, right? <laughs> and he's like 6'5". He's a big dude. He's like, get out, get up. That's an emotional memory every time I light up a cigar. I'm like, Mr. Bokikio, here we go, right? <laughs> a pipe, right? It's another the granddad or... Thanksgiving dinner, whatever it is. There are memories that carry with them deep-seated emotion. And those don't happen outside in the building. They happen in the family. They don't happen with a time clock. They happen over long stretches of time, decades. And even after, the sense of knowing that we belong irreplaceably to someone affects every other relationship we have. How we perceive our boss at work the way someone looked at us or treated us at the store, the one who cut us off or we cut them off. Every person we meet is through that lens of this memory, both recall and emotion. This is the formation of the human person because in the family, the church, this is Pope Francis in his document, Amoris Laetitia, The Joy of Love. The church is a family of families, constantly enriched by the lives of all those domestic churches. We think we need to have a degree to tell our kids about Jesus. No, no, no. We just need to exercise our authority. We don't need to teach them the depths of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ in the Eucharist. You can try. Most times they're looking at us like, do you believe that? It's so much easier teaching a seven-year-old than it is a 17-year-old, especially mysteries like that. We have that privilege. In virtue of the sacrament of matrimony, marriage, every family becomes, in effect, a good for the church. From this standpoint, reflecting on the interplay between family and the church will prove a precious gift for the church in our time. The church is good for the family, and the family is good for the church. This is Pope Francis reminding us of the tradition of the church. He didn't create this. This is his view of the, the interplay, the interdependence of families and the church. 
Now, like with every communion and every munis, there are distinctions. And staying within our role actually helps us to live that role more freely. In other words, the church is not meant to be in its, in the strict sense, liturgical. We're not trying to create monasteries in the home. That may be part of your spirituality, and I don't want to discourage you. But don't think that somehow the monastery or the convent is the model for the ultimate model for family life. Ironically, if you speak to any mother superior, which I have, you speak to any superior generals and they'll tell you their biggest struggle is making the convent and the monastery like a family. How do you bring adult strangers together to live in such a way with gratitude and generosity and perseverance and patience and, and all the virtues? That's the challenge of every community, religious community. They're trying to become what we have naturally. And we look at it and we're like, oh, my family's a mess. And especially, oh, look at them. They're always perfect. I see them every 9.30 mass, 9 o'clock, but there they are. Why can't you kids be like them? <laughs> my kids are the loudest. My kids are the ones doing this. My family's coming this week. I can't come to this because this one is doing this. We all think we, we, have the, we have the grace for ourselves, but we also have the inverse funhouse mirror thinking that everybody else has got it together and we suck. I call this the gospel of the suck. <laughs> There's the gospel of Christ, where you are a son or daughter of God, the Father. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. When he looks at you, he sees not what you've done, but he sees you as who he is. To, you are to him. That's the gospel of Christ. Become what you are. Gospel of the suck is, I'll never do that. Everybody else has got, we got to get everything just right before we could ever present ourselves out. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Because it turns out that that mess that we hate so much, that mess that we're so ashamed of, is actually the raw material for every family. It's the stuff that we have and we work, and the Holy Spirit God comes in and He sanctifies and He blesses and He elevates. If we take the stuff away, there's nothing to sanctify. Or somehow we think, oh, we did this. And trust me, my house is a mess, too. Sometimes it's beautiful. Sometimes it's like, seriously? I need you to just cancel all my speaking events because right now, this one, I'm going to jail for murder. <laughs> I mean, there's just, and it's all, did I sleep? Did I eat enough? Did I hit this? Am I mad at somebody else? Did something not go my way? Am I doing a pity party? I mean, it's all the, the, the stuff of now switching from teacher to student. And going back, and be like, Nathan, man, I'm really sorry. Listen, I... I, that was disrespectful. I shouldn't have said that to you. I'm sorry. I was tired from this. I had this. It had nothing to do with you. And I'm sorry I hurt you. And everyone was like, oh, it's okay, Dad. I was like, no, no, it's not okay. And he said, oh, I forgive you, Dad. Good. So we've been intentional about that because we messed up so much. We had a couple of older kids. We didn't, we didn't go through that it's okay to the forgive. And now the forgive is not part of their experience. So we learned now, there's opposite, too. We had a lot more patience then with the older ones, so they learned a lot more. These young ones, I was like, you know what, forget it, whatever. I just, <laughs> but that's, that's me, afraid to be student. All right, let's move through quickly here. We follow Jesus for the good, the true, the beautiful, for love. And I want you to see how it flows from the I to the we to the family to the family of families and how we live as a parish. And I'll throw in again how special St. Andrews is. Their attention the right sight in knowing what it takes for all of you all to become closer in an authentic way. Real friendship. Let's talk about love and joy. What is love? In the English word, we have one word for love. I love Melanie. I love Naomi, Leah, Rachel, Therese, Colette, Veronica, Olivia, Nathan. I love God. I love you. I will love you for the rest of my life. We have one word to describe literally everything from pizza to God, right? One word. But we know it's different. It's context. But I think that makes it harder to speak about the difference. The Greeks had at least four different words for love. Eros, that's seeking romantic, passionate love. Philia, as in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's friendship. 
Storge is a strange Greek word. They talk about icon between a mother and a child. It's this, this belonging, this unity that's itemized in the mom and, and the baby. And agape, this free, total, faithful, and fruitful self-gift. This is the all-in love. I am yours, and you are mine. This is, the, this is the only way to understand the marriage vows. We meet, and oftentimes, whether we meet as friends, philia, or whether we fall in love at first sight, eros, right? That's real. But when you're standing at the altar, the pledge that's made is an agape pledge. Do you come here of your own free will without condition or reservation to give yourselves in marriage wholeheartedly it's a free and total gift. Will you lovingly accept children that God may bless you with and raise them in the knowledge of the Lord and His church? Do you pledge a love that's fruitful? Until death do you part. So all those four marks of free, total, faithful, fruitful speak to what the Greeks kind of pointed at with agape. The gospel gives us the depth and the breadth to see that truth and that love in God. So we need to know what love is. It's a gift of the self, an act of the will. And I love this. How do you make a gift of yourself? Millions of ways. Millions of unique ways that our life and our relationship and our decisions bring to us. But there's a, there's a pattern. You can't give what you don't have. So self-gift requires a self-mastery or self-possession. But you can't possess something that you don't know. So we begin with the self-knowledge. We come to the truth of yourselves. And again, it's, it's, it's the whole person, body, soul, spirit. We come to possess ourselves through the virtues. And then we make the gift of ourselves because we've moved from knowledge to virtue to gift. But it turns out that self-gift actually deepens our knowledge. Love reveals more about ourselves. So the gift of self-gift turns out to be increasing our self-knowledge, which gives us the strength to have more self-possession to make a more sincere self-gift, which then deepens our knowledge even more for more possession and self-gift. It's a dynamism. Self-knowledge, self-mastery, self-gift is the, the pathway, it's the engine for you to become holy. You see, the end, the end, the ultimate end of love is to become fully human because we're made in the image and likeness of God. But if we're made in the image and likeness of God, that means the full humanity has a div divine end, just like it has a divine origin. It doesn't mean we become little gods, you know, like our, our Mormon brothers and sisters think. You're not going to get a planet. But you will share in the divinity of the one true God. So we talked about the beginning of scriptures. All the hints and the prophecies are made bare and clean in the last book of the New Testament, the last book of the Bible, where eternal life, heaven, is described as a wedding feast. And it was hinted at earlier. You'll find it in the Old Testament. Hosea outright says it. God wants to marry us. It's not the first time. Paul, St. Paul, speaks about Christ the bridegroom and the church is the bride. So does John. So this is a fulfillment of all the prophecy and the hints. But it's interesting that the end is marital, if you will. Spousal that Christ the bridegroom and the church as the bride enter into an eternal union and all of eternity is inscribed as a party. It's a wedding feast. This is the joy of love lived out in the human person. And what is joy? The source of Christian joy is the certainty, certainty of being loved by God. That's that belonging I spoke about. To be loved personally by our Creator. 
by the one who holds the entire universe in his hands and loves each one of us in the great human family with a passionate and faithful love. A love greater than our infidelities and our sins. A love which forgives. In other words, joy is relational. It's experienced the irreplaceable belonging to one another. We get glimpses of joy. And when we belong irreplaceably to God and we accept his gift, it's an eternal joy. Which is why joy can handle suffering. Joy can handle good times and bad, sickness and health. It can handle rich poverty. And actually, not till death do us part. It's a love that actually is stronger than death because we believe and follow the God who rose from the dead. These are things that are part of our joy. I'm going to skip through here. These keys. In this talk, I I speak about 12 essential keys that as families we can live to get that muniness, to live that muniness with God, to live that irreplaceable belonging to not only experiences as teachers, parents to our children, but also as students, as they teach us, God teaches us, situations teach us. And I just adapted it today because providentially, we are just entering into Lent. And it's a beautiful overlay to take on right now the many, many things that we can do, the very specific things we can do. But I wanna give you the categories so that you can see how these things are connected especially based on everything that I shared with you today. There's things that we can do individually. For those of us who are married, things we do as a couple. And there's things we do as a family. And I propose to you that there is a a radiation of these keys. That we do need to handle the I first. There's things that we need to do that affect how we show up to our wives or husbands. They could be physical, sleep, Food, prayer, silence. There's things we need to be all that we can be individually. Then there's things we need to intentionally do and be together as a couple. Because it's in our wedding vows specifically, but it's also the source of everything that we propose, invite, proclaim to our children. It's not just tasks that we do. It's easy to look at all these things you can do. But what I'm suggesting is that the keys to family life are honoring the right order. The I, the I thou, and the fruit of the union, which is the family. So let's talk specifically. And I want to offer this now just in the categories of Lent. The first, let's call prayer. And we'll call that a justice to God. So in each of these categories, these three categories, I want to talk about the individual, the couple, and the family. So in this first category of a key to the families of prayer, let me give you some suggestions. Maybe as you discuss, you can talk about what resonates with you, what's, what's not in your sense, but individually. First and foremost, just committing ourselves to prayer, especially if we're uncomfortable. It's not about standing up and giving a great prayer. It's about putting a clock and saying, for 15 minutes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. And what does that mean? It could be written prayers. It could be Magnificat. It could be end of the great Lenten resources. It could be you standing in front of the window. And I do this many mornings. I stand in front of the window, especially when the sun's out. And just to get the sun, there's one window in my dining room where it's full-on sun. And for me, I need that. For me, I need that connection. And some of the times the prayer is mental. It's just, okay, Lord, I offer you this day, all my thoughts, all my emotions, especially when I'm not feeling it. But the key here is not what we do. The key here is that we have made an intentional effort individually to pray. It could be at night, it could be in the morning, whatever suits you, but you set a time and you follow it. St. Jose Maria Escriva says, That if you're not sure how to pray, and you say, Lord, help me pray, be assured you've already started. Don't make this complicated. As a couple, morning or evening blessings. 
These should make you just a little bit uncomfortable. Morning and evening blessings. A husband blessing his wife. A wife blessing her husband. Calling specifically on these sacramental graces. A friend of mine said that, it, it, in fact, it was in the, our Catholic Marriage Summit, one of the interviews I did. It was Chris Stefanik. You guys know Chris Stefanik? He says, calling on the sacramental graces for my marriage in this moment. I was like, oh, brother, that's awesome. Do that and see what happens. Study something together. Work on your marriage. Listen to a podcast. You want something really challenging? Gaze into each other's eyes for three minutes. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard to hide. You can work up to that. It's like adoration. <laughs> Try it for 30 seconds. Let the clock and the alarm go. Didn't do it for a minute. Then do it for, you know, a minute and a half. And before you know it, you'll be three minutes looking at each other. It's, that, that, seriously, that's kind of an advanced one, so <laughs> your mileage may vary. For the family in this prayer, you set an evening time to pray together. Close the day out as a family. You may not pray the whole rosary. We do. We have for a long time. We have all kinds of other variations. My kids know all of them. So they're always trying to game it. They know the rosary is like 17 minutes. They know the Divine Mercy Chapel is like seven and if I break out, you know, the, the daily prayers, then we could do evening prayer, and it's like three minutes, <laughs> right? Four minutes. But it really doesn't matter. Because what happens is your family starts to get its own pace. You start to get the expectation. And especially that kid who's always like, oh, we're going to pray now. Oh, my gosh. I'm in the middle of my game. I'm hungry. I didn't, you know, there's always one or two of those like, we're going to do this again. Would you guys go to another conference? You know? <laughs> Don't, you go, ah. don't, don't let them mess you. Don't let them see you sweat. Hold your ground and, and support each other. Right? Because they're always trying to divide you. My kids did it last night, the young ones. They did it last night. He's like, yes, we are. Your mother said that, didn't she? Well, then sit down. Right? And then they're fine. Then they're absolutely fine. Right? But interesting thing, when we miss a day, like I'm being late or if we're not doing the kids are always like, can't go to bed. We haven't prayed yet. I said, Millie, I'm like, what? <laughs> what did you say? Don't underestimate the power of the offering. Reading the Bible, lots of Lenten series. We're watching Brant Petrie now talking about the Eucharist, and it's three minutes on YouTube, and they love it because we're using the computer. Right? Let's move to the next area fasting. Let's call this the justice to self. This is where we get all the detachments of the things we don't think we're attached to. Fasting is not just about not eating. It's about recognizing all these things in our lives that are probably good. They're probably good. Food is good. Sleep is good. Hot showers are good. <laughs> but the fasting is not, as I explained to my son the other night, it's not just to make yourself hurt. It's like, oh. Look at, look at, look at, I love Jesus. It's the heart check. Lent is the heart check that says, there are things that have holds on my heart that I don't know they have holds on because I haven't tried to take them off. You ever try to take something off like a piece of tape and you think, oh, I'll just take the tape off. And you're like, I can't get this tape off. It's just a piece of tape. I should be able to take this tape off. What? There's an attachment that's deeper than you realize until you try to take it out. And we are to be attached to God alone. So we, the, the, the gooder the thing is, the gooder is to choose. It's only going to be 40 days, y'all. You're not going to die. And if you do, God will say, good job. <laughs> For ourselves, look at food. It could be the kind of food. It could be the frequency of food. It could be the amount of food. And these individual ones ought to be in secret. I'll throw that in there. These should be hidden things. These are things you do for you. You don't tell anybody, today I'm not going to have any ketchup on my hamburgers. Because I'm holy. I'm working. No. Little stuff. Maybe eat a little bit less. Maybe you just eat something without the salt that you know it needs. That counts. That's you saying, I offer this. I offer my preferences to this. Fasting from entertainment, social media. Some of us fasting from talking. 
Just throwing that out there, I'm not making any accusations. As a couple, here's a fast, yielding to each other in matters of personal preference and not making it plain. You want that? Yeah, sure, whatever you want, honey. That's not what I'm talking about. Yielding in matters of personal preference. Finding, a new, or finding or renewing a ritual of connection. Some of you might be familiar with Greg and Lisa Popchak. I got this from them. They're good friends of mine. They have a radio show, More to Life. He's got dozens of books on marriage and family. And they speak about something called rituals of connection. We work together, talk together, play together, pray together. And being intentional about finding those rituals that in this moment draw us closer together. And they change over time. They can change all the, but you're constantly looking for ways of connection in work, talk, play, and pray. It's a beautiful way to look at for this, this Lent. For the family, set family time together. Electronic screen time zone. This one drives my kids crazy. And they swear they're not addicted. Like, just put the phone down. Put, they don't have phones. They have Ma Melanie's phone. I'm like, put your mother's phone down. I'm right in the middle of my game. I've got to finish my Roblox. Man, shut the phone off, man. Right. Increasing the honor of Sunday rest. This one is always a good fun. It's all, it wasn't fun. We always need to go to the store on Sunday. It's like we just, we're missing three things for Sunday breakfast. It's like, why didn't we get it yesterday? But honoring that Sunday rest, making sure that it's a day that's honored to the Lord. And finally, justice to others. Almsgiving, searching, choosing, and supporting a Christian ministry, a charity or cause of your time, your talent, or your treasure. Individually, refraining from online shopping, reaching out to an estranged family member. We took this one on. I'll let you know how it turns out. See if she calls back. Together, Melanie and I are uh, increasing family donations. We actually started this this year as the kids started to make some money, helping them put the savings, spending, and tithing. And it's painful, which I know, I know is good. It's painful for them. Well, how much do I have to give? How much does the Lord tell you to give? <laughs> Volunteering our time, food banks, pro-life centers, homeless shelters, meals for a neighbor, someone having a baby, sending a meal over, writing notes of encouragement to one another. This one's huge, especially with kids. Notes of encouragement. It doesn't have to be a whole treatise, but that gift, that, that pleasing to God is increasing that belonging to one another. Spontaneous acts of affection I'm thinking about my 14-year-old. She's like this tall now, Olivia. And this morning, came down, and she was like, I said, good morning. She said, no, no, no. So I walked over, and I gave her this big hug, and she was like, you're being weird, Dad. Why are you being weird? I'm like, I just want a morning hug. Fine. She loved it. She loved it. She loved it. Those spontaneous acts of affection. And finally, an almsgiving as a family, being creative about the house, adding a picture, taking a picture away, having a wall or a, a, a desktop that's seasonal, and you can put things regarding the Lent or the readings for the week, something that has, gives the, this atmosphere. Again, you don't have to go crazy, but using the house and the life as a place of gifting the presence and the calendar and the liturgy that we'll be experiencing together. You know, a lot of these specific things over the years, Melanie have gotten and I've gotten from lots of other friends and groups, whether in marriage or teaching NFP or, you know, just being around other folks who care also. And there's something about how that external affects our internal, the inside of our house. So we know that we have friends. We know we have people that we admire. We know people that, that we get ideas from or that we spend time with and our kids the same way. And in that sense, the parish as a family of families becomes the place where we not, first and foremost, we worship the Lord. We offer ourselves to God. But it's also the place where we come together as families. And the small group opportunity that I participate in 
I have three. I have a men's group, I have a pipe club, and I have a, a, a couples group. In fact, my men's group met this morning, right, every Thursday. And I can tell you that each one carries something different that I need in me. And a big part of tonight is to encourage you not just to take things home for the odd intra within the house and within your marriage and your family, but to take seriously your participation odd extra out of you, into the family, into the parish, finding, in this case, a small group. And sometimes you have to you, you try different small groups till something clicks. And when you find a group, you're going to be like, how did I not do this before? That's how it's been with me. In fact, Melanie has joined her own. We, we don't together. She had one last night. You know, over her, I don't know why they're meeting over Zoom, but for some reason they're meeting over Zoom. But these small groups are opportunities where you can take the big, you can take yourself, you can meet and encounter, but you can also belong. And as you start to think about these things, not only for yourself, maybe for your marriage or for your family, I want to highly encourage you to, to add to that experience the family of families, the connections that you can make. Because it's more than just ideas that you're going to get. You're going to get confirmation of your belonging, not only to the parish, not only belonging as a Catholic, but the responsibility then we have to draw others to Christ. It's all related. We give what we have, and we don't know what we have until we know. And small groups is a very particular, powerful way of walking at the pace that you need, of finding what you need, of assuring in your own heart that you belong irreplaceably to God, to the church, and to one another. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, we thank you for multiplying and blessing our yes, of giving us what we need in order to draw closer to you, to know that you love us in a way that is almost incomprehensible, that you love us for who we are and not for what we do, that you're constantly, as the perfect Father, calling us to become who you created us to be and cheering us on, chastising a little, admonishing, but always in the name of love and for the truth of love. Lord, bless our yes, bless this parish, bless our friends, bless this night. Let it be a time to begin and begin again. Let these first days of Lent now be the Lent where we experience you so much more fully in Easter, that we come to know who we are, whose we are, and why we're here. In all these things we pray and we offer ourselves through the Holy Family, St. Joseph, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and our Lord Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you, Damon. That was wonderful. It really was. Um, I know I had a number of takeaways that I wrote down, and maybe some of you did too. Uh, one of the biggest things that resonated with me, besides your football coach with the big cigar, uh, no, I, I think of like what we can do during this Lenten season of prayer. And one thing I know uh, my wife and I do is we pray together, and I think that really has helped our relationship. So that resonated with me. And what I'd like to do right now before we start, just because we're going to have about 15 or 20 minutes as a second part of our here is maybe take a few minutes right now and turn to your right or to your left or behind you and maybe tell somebody what resonated with you, what impacted you about Damon's talk more than anything else. And so take a few minutes. I'll be back in about three or four minutes and we'll start the second half of our program. Okay? So, like, I don't think
Okay. Maybe you can just wrap up a little bit of what we're talking about here, and we'll get into our second part of our evening here. Um, the second part of our evening, we're going to hear from three of our parishioners who are sitting up here, Jim Neals, Becca Doherty, and Ron Selzer. We heard Damon this evening talk about living God's plan for a joy-filled family life, about belonging. But he also, at the end of his talk, he started mentioning about belonging not only just to your family and to your church, but for yourself, belonging to a small group we call small faith groups. And how important it has been to him in his life, uh, not only in his family life, personal life, but his spiritual life too. And here at St. Andrew, we have a number of small faith groups that are in place and they're thriving. And Monsignor Picard, our wonderful pastor, his initiative is about small faith groups. He truly believes in order to strengthen the family, to strengthen the church, strengthen our individual and spiritual lives, small faith groups are where it's at. And there are a number of them going on. And so you would like to just share this evening and share some testimonies of three of our parishioners regarding small faith groups, how joining them, how belonging to them has brought them say, closer to, in their spiritual life to the Lord. And in this Lenten season, if we're thinking about the possibility of doing something to strengthen our faith, of getting closer to the Lord in our relationship with our Lord, that maybe small faith groups are for you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce first Jim Neals, a parishioner that a lot of you know, who has five children here at uh, St. Andrew's School, and he wants to talk about his experience with small faith groups. Thanks, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Jim Neals. Uh, I've been a parishioner for 15 years. Uh, I've got five kids, uh, all boys, uh, two that graduated from St. Andrew, and then three that are in right now. So thank you to all the staff for uh, getting, getting us uh, two-fifths of the way uh, there at high school. Um, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, my experience with small faith groups has been um, uh, really enriching. Uh, I've been a, a member of a few during my time here at St. Andrew. Um, what I can tell you is this. Uh, my initial experience was uh, one that was incredibly welcoming. Uh, the, the first group that I was a part of was right when my family and I had moved here uh, 15 years ago. And I was honestly looking for a way to connect with the parish my family and I were from the area originally. So um, when we were relocated, uh, we were looking for a way to connect with, with uh, St. Andrew Parish. Um, and I was... Uh, kind of reached out, my wife had made some connections, um, and a uh, uh, parishioner who I've remained a close friend throughout, and, and I'm actually in a small faith group right now, invited me, uh, and I kind of took a chance, and it was interesting, uh, my perception, I had not been a part of one, my perception was, well, um, this is either going to be a group of people sitting around in a circle, praying, wrote prayer, um, or it's going to be deep theology, and I'm unqualified. So I had those those were my kind of first two perceptions. Uh, what I came to find was that um, really what small faith is all about is, is, is sharing your lives with other people that are seeking the same things you are. Um, if, if you're, I, I would say that if you're regularly receiving the sacraments, if you've chosen Catholic school, uh, you're seeking to live uh, a faith-based, value, values-based life in a world that where it can be kind of challenging. I mean, I work in corporate America, um, and it is, you know, oftentimes I feel like I'm going against the grain. Um, but within small faith, my experience here at St. Andrew uh, is that within small faith, you're around folks that are seeking the same thing. And, I mean, let's face it, there's a famous poem and a famous line, no man is an island. Um, the experience of small faith shows you that um, your... Uh, Trying to go it alone is a lot tougher. Trying to achieve those goals of pursuing heaven, uh, pursuing, helping your children pursue heaven, and identify that as a goal is, is one that um, is a lot more attainable um, in community. Uh, so, and I've been in also in some couples, small faith groups. There's a great, a, a great um, initiative here, Teams of Our Lady. Um, and then I'm in a small faith group now, um, and frankly, um, I mean, the still more description, same goal, 
great group of people, um, you know, regular, consistent, um, and, and really overall, I'd say, uh, striving through the connections down here to get a little closer to up there. So I would really suggest, if you're looking for the next step, to a little deeper beyond the sacraments, uh, beyond school activities, um, CCD, for example, um, really consider this length. This small faith group might be a step for you. I'll turn over to Becca. Thanks, Jay. Hi, I'm Becca Doherty. I also am a parishioner here at St. Andrews. And I just want to tell you real quick three ways that small groups here at St. Andrews have blessed my marriage, me individually, and then my family or my kids. So the last group that Jim just referenced is uh, a men's group here. My dad started a, a men's small faith group here years and years ago. And so when Jim and my husband and a couple other guys started another men's small faith group, they started referring to it as the young men's small faith group. And I think they added handsome somewhere along the way, the young handsome men's small faith group. So after a couple meetings, my husband Dan came home and said, like, these guys are great. We, we talk about the Bible, and like, I feel like I could go out for a beer with them. And um, he said, they're just like a really normal group of guys. And a priest friend of ours says uh, that that's high praise in the Catholic Church because we can be weird sometimes. <laughs> so it's just like a normal group of guys where they share their faith. And I see the effects of that uh, very beautifully in our marriage and in our family life. So I'm thankful, really grateful for, for that, that men's group. Um, personally, I was part of, St. Andrews will run a lot of Bible study, or regular Bible studies throughout the year. And so maybe three to four years ago, I was part of, I participated in a Bible study called Absolute Relativism, where it was, the, the premise was basically, we live in a world where everyone says, you know, I, I have my truth. So like, you believe in your truth, I'll believe in mine. What's good for you is good for you, but like, don't enforce your values or beliefs on me. And so this Bible study uh, was basically, we, we talked about how like we can't all be right. <laughs> you know, if I believe in God and you don't, well, either he exists or he doesn't. And so like, let's get to the truth of it. And so the beautiful thing about our small group, so we would listen, we would watch, um, I think it was Ted Suri maybe was the presenter. We would watch a video, we'd do some readings, and then we would break into small groups. And in our small groups, that's where we talked about like, okay, at work, like this is what I'm kind of dealing with. Or, you know, when I, I was teaching in a Catholic high school at the time, you know, this is what I encounter with my students. Um, so small faith groups provided a way for me personally to kind of like break it down, take this big teaching and then talk about it personally. Lastly, the way that small groups here have affected my family are through the Elizabeth ministry. Amy Leahy and Renee McGovern were here, but I think they both, both left. We'll hear sometimes in Hollywood that like this actress or actor is like one to watch, like an up and coming actor or actress. I think Amy Leahy and Renee McGovern are ones to watch here at St. Andrews. <laughs> they do a fabulous job of, of basically putting together, especially for um, families with children, whether they're small children or teenage children, putting together activities where you can get together, you don't have to RSVP, you just show up if you can make it, you don't if you can't, you bring something if you can, you don't if you can't, and you just have an opportunity in little clips to, to build community. Um, Senior Jews is so big, but these uh, women provide beautiful opportunities to get together and, and chat, to build communio, as, as Damon was saying. And just recently, so I'm a theology teacher by trade, so we, Dan and I have four children, so we'll, we'll go through the teachings of our faith. But then, you know, sometimes they're like, you know, you ask them a question, like, I don't know. So the, the Elizabeth ministry put together an epiphany party so to celebrate the coming of the three kings. And I think we talked about the epiphany, but our kids were like, I don't know. So we go to this epiphany party. The tradition is you cut a cake, and somewhere in the cake there's a little baby Jesus. Whoever gets the baby Jesus is the king for the day. Well, our son Declan, who's six, just happened to get the king. Declan is our child when you ask him, we asked him one day, like, what's your favorite part of church? He goes, when it's over. <laughs> or when we don't have to go. <laughs> I asked him just ahead of Lent, I said, Declan, what should I give up personally? And what should we as a family give up? Without skipping a beat, he said, Mom, you should give up being on your phone in front of us. Okay. Six years old, he's got it. 
I said, what should we give up as a family? He said, we should give up praying the rosary together and brushing our teeth. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so we go to this epiphany party. He gets the baby Jesus in a slice of cake, and he's quite literally and metaphorically the king of the day. He was so happy, and I think now knows what the epiphany is, <laughs> thanks to the Elizabeth ministry or these, these small group gatherings. So I think um, there'll be like a QR code, some sort of sign up at the end of this. And like Jim said, um, there's lots of opportunities and I encourage you to, to join something or show up when you can, because um, it's a great way to, to take kind of this big faith and this big parish and you know, bring it into a, a personal relationship. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Next up is Ron Seltzer. I talk much slower than Becca does. I wanted to tell you a story about a, a young priest I met quite a few years ago. Uh, when I met him, he was just about to be transferred into another parish. And he was very excited about it. He didn't know exactly where the area was. Uh, he actually didn't even know how to get there. It was before GPS. And uh, he told me he was very excited because it was a rather large parish. There were 5,000 5, families in the parish. And he said it, that was wonderful, but it also presented some challenges for him. Because the parish was so large, he had a lot of things to do with regard to bringing intimacy into the parish. And he mentioned a phrase that I'd never heard before, but you heard spoken several times a night. He mentioned small faith group. That young priest that I met was 49 years old at the time. Uh, the parish he was going to was St. Andrew, and the priest was Father Picard. So when he came to our parish in 1988, Monsignor Ricard, who was Father Ricard at that time, was 49 years old. He came to the parish with a lot of things uh, on his agenda. One thing at the top of his list was creating small faith groups. And he immediately went to work in the parish, gathered parishioners, and started planning on starting small faith groups. The first one that I was aware of started with five men, in the rectory. Uh, Father Joe Tracy was in our parish at the time and he started it. That developed into a group of men that exceeded 60 guys after about five years. Uh, the second large group that I was aware of was actually Becca's father, Barry Pine, who's here tonight, who started in his home the same way with a couple of men. And that turned into, Barry, how many guys do you have in the group now? Barry said 80 guys. So on any given morning when they meet uh, in the old church in the basement, there's 80 men that pray and break out together in small faith groups. Those groups have continued on our parish, and today there is a, several hundred men and women that meet regularly in small faith groups. Uh, going back to uh, Mon Monsignor Ricard, uh, true to his word, uh, he knew that small faith groups were good for our parish, and consequently, it was also good for him. So 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, Monsignor Ricard joined the small faith group. And I can tell you, for the last 30 years, uh, we have met on Wednesday morning at 7.30 and discussed uh, what is going on in our life. You can imagine that when we started that group, most of us in our 30s, 40s. Uh, after 30 years, we experienced a lot. We went through a lot, and I can tell you that uh, we've experienced joyful baptisms, we experienced joyful weddings, and unfortunately, we experienced quite a few funerals. Uh, I will tell you in that 30-year period, speaking for myself, uh, we lost our son, Ronnie, in a car accident. And I will tell you honestly that uh, I lost myself. And uh, for months and months, I continued to go to our small faith group. And were it not for the six men in that small faith group, I can assure you that I would not be standing here tonight. I'm not sure I'd be standing anywhere. But for months, uh, I struggled 
with confusion, with questions, with anger, and frankly, I was, I was having difficulty with the Lord, blaming God for the loss of our son. By the grace of God and the patience of the men that were in that small faith group, uh, they showed me love, they showed me compassion, they showed me patience, and over time, uh, you never get healed from that, but I certainly am able to live a fruitful and productive life. Uh, a few years ago, suddenly, I lost my wife. She passed away at our home at the Jersey Shore. And um, when I went down to the shore to take care of what I had to take care of, and when it was finished, uh, I drove home that night. Uh, it was in the middle of the night, and by the time I got home to our house, it was five or six o'clock in the morning. When I opened up the door to walk in the house, there were six men there at five, six o'clock in the morning. It was Monsignor Ricard and five other guys. Uh, it showed me their love, their compassion, and shortly thereafter, Monsignor celebrated Mass in our living room and offered it up for uh, my wife, Ray. Uh, there are many other things that happen in small faith groups. There's another group that I'm involved in, I just want to tell you it's a lot lighter, but at the same time it's serious and it's something maybe you can relate to. One of the fellows in the small faith group came and told us when he went home from work that night, he was having problems with his older son that he couldn't resolve and he worked on it for a long time. When he went home, he was going to tell his son to pack his bag and get out of the house. We sat there throughout that small faith group and listened to him, asked some questions, and I'm sure while he was talking, men in the small faith group, there were about 12 of us in a group, there were men in there praying for him. When the small faith group was over, John stood up with tears in his eyes, thanked every one of us, and said, when I go home tonight after work, I'm going to look at my son in the eye, put my arms around him, give him a hug, tell him I love him and say, by the grace of God, we're going to work out this problem. That happened in the small faith group. Last story. The gospel reading for this past, the first Sunday of February, was the gospel passage where Jesus heals uh, Peter's, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. And within that gospel, which we all read, and I read it, I missed the phrase, it said, that Jesus said, and for this is my purpose. It's why I came. And the way we start our small faith group is it's a, small, it's a short prayer. We read the gospel for the coming Sunday, and then we sit quietly, and each man in the group thinks about what that gospel is telling him right now. Where it's that Jesus Christ spoke 2,000 years ago, but is speaking to us this morning. And because we're all different, we take different things from the gospel. We sat quietly after that reading, and one of the guys said, hey, fellas, do you know what your purpose is in life? And we all looked at him. And for the next hour or hour and a half, 12, 13, 14 guys, however many of us were in that room, talked about knowing what our purpose in life is, knowing that the purpose in life that we have that was given to us by God is to be a good husband, and a good father. And for an hour and a half, that's what we talked about. And it was beautiful, the things that the men said about their families. And I thought after the guys left, how wonderful it was going to be that night when they got home to their families. They're the kinds of things that happen in small faith groups. When Monsignor came here, I told you, he was 49 years old, and he started small faith groups. And he said, I'm going to pray and pray and pray. That was 36 years ago, and I can assure you that Monsignor still prays for small faith groups. And so I'm going to ask you to consider something. This May the 30th is our Monsignor Picard's 86th birthday. He continues to pray for you in hopes that you join a small faith group. I'm going to ask you to give yourself a present for my senior's birthday. Unwrap the package that he's been praying to give you for the last 36 years and consider deeply joining a small faith group. It's not 
as Jimmy said, it's not a bunch of guys that understand scripture, that open up the Bible every day. They're guys like you and me that are dealing with life's issues and can find answers within Jesus Christ and being with a group of men that you learn to respect and trust. I would hope that you would consider it. It's not a lifelong commitment. I would hope it to be. But what it could be is a commitment you can make for Lent. Uh, and if you're a nervous type like many of us are, you might consider asking a friend to join with you. But please consider giving yourself and your family what I think is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. And, and again, give your family, give your kids, give your husband, give your wife. And that's the peace and joy that you will get from spending time with a group of men or women that you will develop a relationship like you've never had in your life before, that will be there and be a circle of love for you when you get through the tragedies in life that I have and most of us have. God bless you and thank you. Ron is uh, such an incredible man. He uses, we use his home. He's got three or four groups that go there a week uh, for weekly small faith groups. I do have to add one other thing, too, with regard to small faith groups. And the men of St. Andrew know, if it wasn't for the men of St. Andrew, I wouldn't be ordained. I came up to this parish from a different parish, and I went to Barry's small faith group, which Barry's 7 o'clock, right, this Saturday at the old church, the basement of the old church, 7 o'clock this Saturday. If you're up, want to take a walk over? Do it. I did. Doesn't mean you're going to be ordained a deacon, believe me, okay? So don't get scared. Don't get scared. I'm still scared, okay? When I look in the mirror and I see this on me, I'm still scared. But I'll never forget the first meeting I went to. First of all, I, I think Joel Kern invited me. And I said, well, okay, Joel, well, what is it and what time? He goes, Men's small faith groups, 7 a.m. old church, Saturday morning. Again, who's the idiot that started at 7 a.m.? I said, this is crazy. I went, and I remember I was just in awe of the men here. I just sat there, and I didn't say anything. You don't have to say anything. I sat there, and I saw 40 men in this praying the rosary and then breaking up into smaller groups, talking about the gospel, and I just sat and listened and listened. I went home to Mary Ellen. I went, oh, my gosh. I mean, I said, like Jimmy was saying, I felt like, I, I didn't belong, or I didn't, these guys are just way above me. And I went back again, and I went back again. And they were just guys, as Ron's saying, just trying to get together, to try to be together and, you know, try to do what Jesus wants us to do, to be nice to each other, to our families, as Ron said, to be good husbands, fathers, brothers, friends. And little did I know how that would take me to a point where now I'm an, I'm an ordained deacon in the Catholic Church. Still blows my mind. That, uh, but if he can do that to me, he can change your heart into whatever he wants to. There's no doubt. So as Ron was saying, we just passed out some forms. The, on the forms, you can fill them out to this evening if you like, or scan the QR code. Fill out the form. It's a Lenten season. You know, I, I talk sometimes about comfort zone. Boy, I'm out of my comfort zone here, man. I was out of my comfort zone the first time I walked into a small faith group, and you will be too. But believe me, when you're doing something for the Lord and you take that first step out of your comfort zone, he grabs you. He does. He grabs you, and he pulls you right in. And you'll never think about going back that way, except you'll take a step another step. Where is he going to pull me this time? Is he going over here? Am I going over? And his hand, he will lead you all the way to where he wants you to be. Believe me, you know, in this night and season where we try to think about uh, what we want to do, as Damon eloquently said about, you know, the individual, okay, the couple and the family, this is something you can do for yourself that will help yourself, will help your marriage, and it will help your family. So I encourage, you know, each and every one of you to give it a thought, pray over it, say, you know what, maybe I can do this. For the women, I know there's some wonderful women's groups, too, out there, too. But for the men that I see tonight, hey, 7 a.m. Saturday morning, old church basement. It's pretty cool. Um, so in closing, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Thank you for coming out. 
Um, your kids are going to thank you, too, because you're going to pick up some passes on the way out. Don't forget that, right? But, no, I, I, I do want to thank you there. I want to thank Damon Owens again so much. I appreciate everything you said. And just to let you know, Damon's going to come back to our parish again next month, and the date is going to be March 10th and March 9th. It's a Saturday. And it's from 10 to 11.30 at the Old Church. And the topic that day is when the world's turned upside down, which it is, as we all know right now. So I can't wait, Damon, to hear what you have to say and how we can try to handle that within our families and in our belief and our faith system, too. So thank you. So be, to, be sure to check us out on Flocknote on the website and sign up for there. Um, there is free offering baskets. We charge nothing, but we ask you, Whatever you can afford. If you can't afford anything, that's fine. If you can't, that's great. If you can afford something, that's how we can afford to present evenings like this for everybody here and for all the parishioners. So we appreciate any amount, any amount you can. So you know what? Join me, seriously, join me in a prayer, please, before we leave. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. God, you are so good. You are good and all loving and all generous. We thank you, God. We thank you for this evening that we share together with our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to Damon Owens, to each and every one of us, to our parishioners who witnessed about their small faith groups. Heavenly Father, we ask you to watch over us as we go home tonight. Watch over our families. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for loving us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for opening our hearts to becoming closer to you and loving you for the creator that you are. And we say glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Andrew, pray for us. Thank you again so much. God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>